Okay, I think we will go right on to the uh, first speaker here. We are really happy to have Jenny Silander from Karolinska Institutet uh, here today. I've listened to Jenny several times before and I know she has so many interesting studies going on, uh, rather big ones often. Uh, she has taken an interest in exposure of the mother at the work when she is pregnant and what happens to the child afterwards and, and uh, when she, the child grows up. And you actually do look at different kind of exposure, but you will focus on noise today, I would guess. Yes, Thank that's you. true. Thank you so much. Uh, very nice to be here today. Um, and it's true that I will focus on noise today. The title of my speak today is Occupational Noise June Noise Exposure During Pregnancy and Health Effects in the Mother and Child. And I'm an associate professor at the Unit of Occupational Medicine at Karolinska Institute. Okay, um, so why focus on occupational exposure? Well, the woman of women of childbearing ages are often occupationally active. The medical birth registry actually show that 78% of the expecting mothers in Sweden are occupationally active during, during pregnancy week 10, when they are registered. And uh, among those who are working, 68% work full-time in the beginning of pregnancy. And 23% work part-time. So it's a lot of exposed, potentially exposed pregnancies each year, actually. And the pregnant women uh, are exposed to a mixture of exposures at work, of course, not only noise. It's uh, physically strenuous work, viruses, metals, whole body vibration, noise, of course, uh, particles, air pollution, chemicals, work-related stress. And it all depends on the occupation they choose to work in. But this is very important when you study different kinds of exposures. That sometimes they do also correlate. And you need to adjust for other exposures. So exposure to noise during pregnancy. Uh, it was previously thought that the fetus was well protected from noise in the womb, actually. So you could hear, it could hear the sound, but uh, it was really reduced a lot on its way into the fetus. However, uh, experimental studies show that that's not really true. High frequency noise is attenuated quite well. Uh, so about 20 to 50 dB could be reducted on its way into the fetus. Um, but low frequency noise is not actually. Um, it's not attenuated that much. And there are even studies that show that low frequency noise can be amplified in its way into the fetus. Studies on guinea pigs and sheep, that's just like humans have a fully developed auditory system in the last trimester, uh, have shown an increased risk of hearing dysfunction in offspring when mothers were exposed to uh, high levels of noise, I would say, during pregnancy. Of course, we're speaking of very high, loud noise levels. Um, so this is one of those studies, uh, Richards et al, that um, have measured noise level outside and inside the womb. And this is a reduction, so the difference between the two points, outside and inside the womb next to the fetus ear. Um, so for Low frequency, this is low frequency, and high frequency, you can see a really change. The high frequency noise could be, is quite reducted uh, in this study, it was 10 to 15 dB reduction, of course, some were lower, but the low frequency noise weren't reducted at all, or even amplified. So that was a bit surprising. Of course, this is one study, uh, other studies have shown a similar sort of 
uh, increase of reduction depending on frequency level, but not this amplification in other studies. So it's a bit different. But it, it's depending on frequency. That's sort of the consensus you can s make from these experimental studies. So, so this makes you a bit concerned about the child's hearing, especially when they work in occupational noise exposure. It could be very, very loud. And uh, they have these hearing protection devices they put on the mother, but of course not the belly. And um, that's why it's important to study if those exposures actually causes harmful health effects. But occupational noise uh, also is a stressor uh, and it can affect fetal growth. So it's not only the auditor system, because noise is regarded as a stressor. Uh, it activates the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary gland and the adrenal glands, the neurobarkian, uh, that coordinates the hormone response in the body, the endocrine system, releasing sort of stress hormones, uh, cortisol, for instance. So during pregnancy, the mother uh, and the fetus have their own sort of endocrine system and own stress response. And they're also integrated by the placenta. And these act as three separate neuroendocrine systems. So it's quite a vulnerable system when you're pregnant. So long-term stress, uh, long-term noise exposure, sorry, during pregnancy can lead to, uh, we think, uh, preterm birth, low birth weight, being small for your, for your stational age, and uh, hypertension, so high blood pressure in the mother, and preeclampsia. Um, these are the suspected, I would say, uh, sort of possible outcomes that are uh, needed to be studied. Some studies have been made. <coughs> For instance, when we, if we go back to hearing, we have three nice epidemiological studies. A French study on 75 children to textile workers, a Canadian study on 131 children exposed to occupational noise, and a Brazilian study on 80 children. Uh, two showed an increased risk, one didn't show an increased risk of uh, hearing damage caused by occupational exposure during pregnancy. But these studies are small and of course, like all studies, have methodological problems, so there are more studies uh, to need to be done. I will talk about our study soon. So we have made a study on occupational noise and hearing impairment. But first, um, I would also like to add that there are studies, of course, on occupational noise and fetal growth and preterm birth. Uh, in a recent review by Ristakovska, uh, they found eight sort of high quality studies actually on this topic, and five of them showed a significant increase of effects on fetal growth and preterm birth in connected with high levels of occupational exposure sort of an increased risk of about 20 to 40 percent uh, of uh, a low birth weight and, and a small physicational age were connected to occupational noise exposure of high levels um, in studies using a population-based sample including different occupations, so a mixture of occupations. You can see higher um, associations when you study specific of occupations, for instance, textile workers in China, uh, we have this um, military personnel as well in this review, the association was stronger. But however, as you saw in my first slide, uh, the studies limited to one occupation are in danger of reflecting other occupational differences than just noise exposure. Of course, you are exposed to a mixture of compounds. And if you study just one occupation, you are at risk at studying something else than noise as well. That you need a mixture, I think, 
to be able to um, reduce correlation with other occupational exposures. But some of those studies uh, show very strong, strong risks. However, most of these studies rely on subjective exposure assessments, small samples, and have a retrospective design. So we are in need um, to have more studies on this. Um, we are, are doing our part, and I will tell you what we are doing. But uh, please, if anyone else is are interested <laughs> in this field, um, we need more studies. So what are we doing then? Uh, we have a new nationwide population-based registry study. Uh, one is published and, and uh, the other one is not. But it's the same registry, the same, same study cohort. It's a mixture of our really nice registers we have here in Sweden. So it's the medical birth registry, the patient registry, the LISA registry, we have uh, information on education, income, and so on. And the MIDAS registry, we have uh, sick leave, parental leave, and all this uh, information. So we have a lot of data collected already. So we are actually combining it. Uh, and in the beginning, we have information about 2.3 million births. When would you gather that kind of data? From this uh, mixture, we could retrieve good data on confounding factors, mother's age, nationality, BMI. Since in the interview uh, at the prenatal care facilities, the mothers are actually um, um, measured with height and weight. So we have the BMA, BMI measured from all mothers. Uh, the diagnosis, the family structure, questions on smoking, snuff use. And we have education and income from other registers. We also have, of course, child's gender parity and, and sort of diagnosis there. But they are also asking about occupation, and that's uh, the key issue for us. So at the registration interview in, in Pregnancy Week 10, they are asking the mothers, what are you working with right now? Uh, and this we have coded from free text into occupational codes to be able to see uh, where the mothers have been working. They also asked, asked the question, uh, are you working part-time, full-time, or not at all right now? So we have the occupation and we have the sort of uh, how much they're working, at least at the beginning of pregnancy. But then we, we wanted to get retrieve absence from the workplace the rest of the pregnancy. Because, of course, in the beginning is one thing, but what about the rest? So we gather data on parental leave, sick leave, and, and uh, different kinds of uh, beneficial leave of absence that you can get if you're pregnant and working in, in occupational exposures. So we have data uh, on those to see who was there or not at the workplace. We also have data on unemployment and other occupational exposures through these job exposure matrices. Because this is the way we connect exposure with our data. We have something called a job exposure matrix. We can't measure it on two million people uh, in retrospect. This is impossible. Uh, so what we do is to identify the occupation they have uh, and we have sort of occupational code and we connect it to this job exposure matrix that's conducted on measurement reports from different occupational sites all over Sweden that have been collected. So if you have um, occupational code you also have a level of occupational noise exposure and different of course in time so five year or time bands and different levels of exposure. And this picture is three levels, below 75 dBA, 75 to 85, and over 85 dBA. So this is how we connect exposure to noise with our registry-based data. And we also have job exposure matrices on different exposures, like 
chemicals, air pollution. Uh, we will build now one on whole body vibration and we have one on physical strenuous work, for instance, as well. So this is a study that has been published, um, occupational noise during pregnancy and hearing impairment in children. <coughs> we wanted to combine the information on uh, are you working now uh, full-time, part-time, not at all, and how much there have been absence during pregnancy to three subgroups. So those working full-time uh, with less than 20 days leave of absence in the pregnancy, those who work part-time and those who weren't really working. The they said they weren't working or they said they were working but then had a lot of uh, days of leave of absence. And as you can see, even though we connect the mother's exposure with uh, occupational code, sorry, with exposure, you could see no increase in the mothers that hadn't been working, hadn't been there. You can see a small increase, like 25 or 20, 26, 25 percent, but not statistically significant in the part-time workers. But those women who were there, who, had, who said they were working full-time in the beginning of pregnancy and had less than 20 days leave of absence, you can see a significant increased risk of hearing impairment in children connected with occupational noise exposure above 85 dB. Uh, we also wanted to study um, fetal growth and, uh, and um, this is to preliminary results, so not to be cited and so on, but we see a similar increase when we divide the, the mothers in a similar way, not working part-time, full-time. We see an increased risk of, in this case, small for gestational age when working in high levels of occupational exposure. And the same goes for, for low birth weight. We also see a significant increased risk in this. What is in, uh, interesting is, is we did don't see anything for part-time workers, uh, but we see also a small increase in the middle exposed group actually for fetal growth. So the child might be stressed and therefore not grow enough when working in occupational exposures. But this is pre preliminary, so, so uh, please cite other sources um, befo before it has been published. <laughs> uh, the project group consists of me and Per Gustafsson, Maria Albin, Lars Rolander, Marie Levné and Ulf Rosenhall. It's a mixture of people in Karolinska, Lund, and um, yeah, Karolinska and Lund. <laughs> in this project. So that's what's it for me. Thank you so much. Mm. Mm. Good. Thank you, Jenny. This was a very interesting presentation. And you had some really shocking information there. Okay. Um, uh, Aya will take some questions, I'm sure. We are actually got started almost a bit too good this morning, so we are very well with time. So if you have questions uh, to Jenny, mm. please uh, let them. Uh, yeah. Get on. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, that was really exciting. I'm Ulrika Odien from Karolinska as well. Okay. I'm a pediatrician and uh, I was just interested to hear um, whether you have any anything in the experimental literature um, supporting the theory that there's a, a, a causative effect of the noise um, when looking at the small for gestational age or low birth weight. Yes, um, ooh, I just cited the epidemiological data here, but, but yeah, there are experimental studies, there are um, in animals, uh, usually measuring um, sort of hormone levels, I, I would say, and um, yeah, 
I guess it would be pretty easy to do, just yes. expose mm. rat mothers or so for noise yeah. and see. But they, they are experimental studies, mm. but I'm sorry, I can't really cite them here today for you. Mm. Vineta Felman, London, Helsinki. I'm also a neonatologist. Uh, thank you for this epidemiological data. It's very important. My question relates to the individuals. Do you have any prospective studies to show that the, what the real noise uh, uh, stress for the um, uh, mother or for the uh, woman is because just looking at an occupation you don't really know what that person is doing so so we really would need to have the real numbers how much was it affecting and what about BMI of the mothers that if you have a lot of good fat around yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we adjusted for for BMI actually uh, but uh, not the w not the weight gain during pregnancy, but we have that uh, data as well. Um, yeah, there's a bit more insulation, that's true. <laughs> um, but it's also important, of course, uh, the, the child's weight is very dependent on the mother's weight and, and sort of, so it's, we have d uh, adjusted for BMI in our analysis, of course. And we also have adjusted for other occupational exposures. So do you have possibility to measure the No. Um, since uh, occupational high levels of occupational exposure is quite rare, uh, so we have to have really big data. Um, we, we don't have the because this has already happened, so we have not, not the possibility to measure it now. Of course, perhaps we could, you mean, call, um, identify the women and, and try to go to the workplace afterwards and and just <coughs> okay assess the noise there. Um, it could be done, but this is data from 1986 to 2008, so it, but the workplace could have changed quite a lot. So I would suggest a different kind of study instead to looking at that. Of course, um, but you don't want to expose pregnant women to something that's harmful. Just, just follow their own choices in life and to see if there is an increased risk. Yeah. So I'm not sure how to design sort of a measurement study there. Uh, my name is Tara Broms. I'm an audiolo medical audiologist here in Lund. I wonder, can you say anything about the noise damage to the hearing in those children with mothers who has been exposed to a great amount of noise? Yeah, I can only see the diagnosis because we only follow them in registers. But uh, is the sensor sensor neural um, hearing impairment and, and tinnitus, for instance? And you can say that there are uh, they are more damaged in those groups with mothers who has been exposed to high levels of noise than in other children, so to say. Uh, we couldn't say m m the degree of, of no, we, we couldn't say something about that, only the diagnosis, that there are more children with that diagnosis in groups where the mother had exposure, high exposure during pregnancy. Hmm. That's interesting. We have <coughs> time, actually. Um, I have a question. Uh, when you mentioned those, there were three groups that stood out, and teachers were, of course, one yeah. of them. But there were correlations between low birth weight and those groups, special? Um, um, okay, you mean the, the job the exposure the matrix? Yes, there. Yeah. full time exposure. Mm. Um, well, um, the teachers are would be included in the middle group there, I think. Uh, not depending on the preschool teachers uh, would be in the middle group, but uh, maybe not the. Yeah. Um, I haven't studied each occupation, only the combined assessment, actually. I would say, but uh, they are included in the middle group. They are, yeah. I can say so. So nothing on on the hearing impairment uh, because there's too low noise exposure, but yeah. fetal growth, mm. yeah, it's very it's a risk. Mm. Uh, we have time for one more question. Anybody? 
Yeah. I have a question then. There was uh, <laughs> Shashtin. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, you said that. Uh, uh, my name is Shashtin Passion Way. Uh, and you said that uh, you looked at the diagnosis of hearing out come on among the children. What type of diagnosis are you then referring to? Uh, there's different kinds. Ulf Rosenhall is, is really the expert who helped us uh, pick the, the diagnosis of uh, hearing impairment. So it's all types of diagnosis that were connected to noise exposure. So we, for instance, left out ledningshinder, I'm sorry, I'm not the <laughs> English term, uh, and those kind of uh, hearing impairment that could be done to viruses and, and to other uh, kinds of uh, exposures and, and genetic, uh, and only looking at those who were noise exposure. So, so sensory neural, hörselinsättning and, uh, and tinnitus were, were the two major groups, but also other smaller diagnoses that were related to noise exposure.